Welcome to Human Monsters. May 31st, 1985. 17-year-old Sharon Sherry Smith would wake this day incognizant of how significant it would be in the annals of her life. It was a swelteringly hot South Carolina day. It was still mid-spring, but that's the nature of the climate in that region of the United States. It was hot enough for the flies to come back to life and feast upon carrion who had met their end in the great outdoors, human or animal. The kind of day in which the world is one huge incubator for the maggots that writhe and dine on the freshly carved wounds. For some beings, their own corner of the planet is an abattoir, and whether a task calls for a butcher or a scavenger, everybody gets a portion. Sherry Smith was soon to find herself a spoke in the wheel of life and liquidation. The process would not wait for nature to run its course in the form of the typical kind of anatomical decline that emerges with age. No, circumstances escalated the process. Sherry sure didn't have death on her mind, especially not with so much to look forward to in the coming days. Her high school graduation was two days away. Following that, there was a class trip to the Bahamas scheduled. She was busy on this day. First, she said a prayer with her family, a gathering that had become embedded in their routine. She was also due to attend a practice for her school's chorus. For she was such a talented singer, she was selected to sing the Star Spangled Banner at the commencement ceremony as a duet with a fellow alumnus. After all that activity, she cooled off at a friend's pool party. Once that was over, she was ready to head home, exhausted but content. It was a pleasant day, and she awaited the future with optimism, excitement, and hope. Sherry drove home to her family's house in Lexington, which is a suburb of Columbia, the state's capital. Before entering the house, she stopped to check the mailbox. While removing some letters, the sound of a car driving at a high rate of speed with squealing tires pulled up behind her. The driver was a man. He looked at her like a predator in the wild like she was nothing but walking meat. He said something to her, but she couldn't make out what he was saying over the sound of his running engine. Rather than repeat himself, the man got out of the car and approached Sherry. Everything that happened next seemed to take little more than a nanosecond. Suddenly, the man grabbed Sherry and pressed a gun against a bare patch of her skin. He told her that if she wanted to live, she would get in the car. This sheltered, middle-class Christian girl from a good home had never been exposed to the kind of nefarious underworld into which she was about to be immersed. She kept her distance from Satan, but this devil made house calls. Sherry's father, Bob, a Baptist preacher and engineer, was out by the pool with his wife, Hilda, when they began to suspect something was not right with Sherry. Confirmation came when he saw that her car was parked at the end of the driveway. At first, he assumed she was rifling through the mail. However, later he checked again, and the car was still there, only Sherry was not. Sherry, despite her age, was very dependable. It was not like her to behave like this. Dread cast a shadow over Bob as he took all this in. When Bob went out to Sherry's car to investigate further, his worst fears were realized. The engine was still running, 
but she was nowhere to be found. Something terrible had happened. The mail was scattered across the ground, indicating that whatever led to Sherry's absence involved her being strong-armed into abduction. She also did not take her medication with her. She had a condition called diabetes insipidus, colloquially known as water diabetes. Symptoms manifest when the patient becomes dehydrated, which was always a risk in a climate like South Carolina during the warm weather months. Bob ran in the house and told Hilda about his findings. She took a half-hour drive around their residential district in hopes of tracking her down, but she could not be found. When she returned, she and Bob spoke with police when they came to their house to begin the early stages of the investigation. Once the police left and initiated the investigation in earnest, Bob and Hilda prayed for the safety and return of their daughter. The search for Sherry Smith became one of the largest in the history of Lexington County. The government pulled out all the stops. Helicopters hovered over the entire area. South Carolina's Emergency Preparedness Division set up tractor trailers to serve as a base for the operation. This location contained state-of-the-art communication, tracking, and analysis equipment. It was active 24 hours a day. There was an underlying urgency, not just because Sherry had disappeared, but also that if she were still alive, she might not last long without access to her medication. If Sherry had been bred in dissimilar circumstances, some in law enforcement might have ventured a theory that she had run away. In this case, such conjecture was soon dismissed. In the words of Captain Bob Ford of the Sheriff's Department, She's not a runaway. We can't accept any theories that she ran away from home. The public was encouraged to reach out if they thought they had any information that could be helpful to the case. Many reported seeing a suspicious car driving up just as Sherry got to the mailbox. They described the car as having a reddish, purplish, or maroon-type color. They said it may have been an Oldsmobile Cutlass, a model from between 1982 and 1984. They said that two men got out of the car. They claimed to have seen the car pass by the Smith house again later. The search stretched into the weekend. A hundred volunteers searched every nook and cranny of the area despite the stifling heat. The helicopters continued to buzz overhead as canine unit bloodhounds sniffed the area for any trace of Sherry Smith's scent. The telephone at the Smith house was wiretapped. The only clue came in the form of a red bandana that belonged to Sherry. It was discovered at the side of a road. Speculation had it that Sherry threw it outside the vehicle as a means of dropping breadcrumbs, so to speak. The search through 20 miles in intense heat yielded a couple of volunteers fainting, one man stepping on a rusty nail, and a police officer being bitten by a spider. But no trace of Sherry. Police hoped that a kidnapper would demand a ransom. When the promise of monetary gain is involved, you can at least negotiate with the perpetrator. This option had yet to emerge, not even after a three-day search. At a loss for alternatives, the police requested assistance by the FBI. One element that was puzzling to the authorities who lent their expertise to the case was the profile not of the potential offender, but of Sherry. Most girls are abducted and or abused by someone they know well, particularly a member of their immediate family. Sherry did not come from a dysfunctional family and was not abused. 
Her family were well regarded in the community and did not affiliate with what one would deem undesirables. Sherry didn't do drugs and had never run away from home. Her circle of friends did not trickle in from the gutter. They were good kids from good homes, just like Sherry. Her dream was to become a professional gospel singer. Who would want to harm such a girl? Her father sometimes ministered in prisons and would occasionally bring Sherry along to perform her vocals for the inmates. You can be sure that whatever was on their minds during the performance was not nearly as wholesome. Still, evidence that she was abducted by an ex-con had not presented itself. According to the FBI's statistics, stranger danger as a factor in kidnappings is not nearly as well represented as it was once assumed. In Sherry Smith's case, it would have been foolhardy to rule it out entirely. At one point, Bob and Hilda assembled family and friends in their living room to say a communal prayer as their appeal for the safe return of Sherry. Bob led the prayer, which went, God, we know that while we don't know where Sherry is, we know that you know where she is, and we're going to trust you to watch over her. We're going to look to you to bring her home and get us through this. Losing their child is what every loving parent fears the most. And the fear of the unknown was now just as potent as the fear of the worst-case scenario that played upon their anxieties. Sherry's older sister, Dawn, returned to Lexington to comfort her family and assist in the investigation. She reported to police that the only conflict in Sherry's life came from her relations with Bob which were sometimes marred by tension due to his strict parenting style. She was a normal teenager who wanted more freedoms, so there was nothing from that scenario that amounted to evidence in the investigation. A call for a ransom was finally received. Keep in mind, in missing persons investigations like these, especially in those where the family of the abducted person are financially secure, people claiming to be the kidnapper may demand a ransom, despite being guilty only of little more than fraud and the threat of bodily harm once they make the call. To quote the caller, I have Sherry, I want money, and I want you to put the Smith family's phone number on TV so I can talk to them. If you don't give me what I want, I'm going to add Sherry to the missing persons list. He wanted $2,000. Police traced the call to a local phone booth. The perpetrator did not return to the location. The call turned out to be a sick and cruel prank played on the Smiths by a 27-year-old child named Edward Robertson. An 80s troll, in other words. He was an ex-con and couldn't think of anything more valuable or constructive to do with his time. Like many ex-cons, he was so institutionalized, he found civilian life boring and unfulfilling, so he took credit for the call and was returned to prison. Other hoax calls were made, contributing more turmoil to the Smiths' lives. June 2nd, Sherry's high school graduation came and went without Sherry's presence and involvement. It was just as devastating for her family as everything else. June 3rd, the phone rang at the Smith house. It was 2 a.m. Bob answered it. The voice at the other end asked to speak to his wife. Bob said, I'm Mr. Smith. Can I help you? The caller refused to speak with Bob, only with Hilda. 
When Hilda got on the line, the caller told her he wanted to speak with her about Sherry. They said they had some important information to impart to her regarding Sherry. To prove that they weren't just another hoaxer, they began to run through details about Sherry and her life that only someone who knew her well, like a member of her immediate family, would know. The caller had credibility. For instance, he described the clothes she was wearing at the time of the abduction. Hilda confirmed that she owned the articles of clothing of his description. He went on to tell her that authorities were conducting the search in the wrong areas. He told Hilda to expect a letter from Sherry in the mail that following afternoon. He insisted she note such details as the date and time the letter was written. He also suggested that she tell Sheriff Metz to appear on the evening news and cancel the search. With that, the caller hung up. Hilda's mind was racing. That man was no crank. It sounded like he really did have Sherry, and he really meant business. Authorities traced the call to a phone booth outside a grocery store. It was located at the outskirts of town, just about ten miles from the Smith house. The police searched the phone booth and found no evidence of the offender. They also deduced that he knew what he was doing because he had done it before, many times. Given the urgency of the situation, the police were not willing to wait for the letter to arrive at the Smith residence. They conveyed to the local postmaster how important it was that the police intercept that letter. Officers were given the task of sorting through the day's mail to find any letter addressed to the Smith's house. It took three hours, but they finally found what they were looking for, a legal-sized envelope with no return address naming the Smith family as its intended recipients was discovered. Despite this finding, the police did not feel it would be appropriate for them to open the letter first. They invited Bob Smith to do the honors. The officers transferred the letter to a sheet of plastic, careful to preserve whatever residual DNA might remain on the document. They kept copies for their own use. The letter was two pages in length and written on the kind of yellow legal pad one might use to take notes. The contents were written in cursive, recognized by Sherry's parents immediately as being hers. On the first page, she wrote the phrase, God is love. Underneath it, she drew a heart, and beneath the heart, she wrote, Shaw Richard, a reference to her relationship with her boyfriend Richard. The following comprises the rest of the letter. 6185, 310 a.m. I love y'all. Last Will and Testament. I love you, Mommy, Daddy, Robert, Dawn, and Richard, and everyone else, and all other friends and relatives. I'll be with my father now. So please, please don't worry. Just remember my witty personality and great special times we all shared together. Please don't let this ever ruin your lives and just keep living one day at a time for Jesus, some good will come out of this. My thoughts will always be with you and in you. Casket closed. I love you all so damn much. Sorry, Dad. I had to cuss for once. Jesus, forgive me. Richard, sweetie, I really did and always will love you and treasure our special moments. I ask one thing, though, accept Jesus as your personal Savior. My family has been the greatest influence on my life. Sorry about the cruise money. Somebody please go in my place. Sorry if I ever disappointed you in any way. I only wanted to make you proud of me. Because I have always been proud of my family. 
Mom, Dad, Robert, and Dawn. There's so much I want to say that I should have said before now. I love you. I know you all love me and will miss me very much, but if you'll stick together like we always did, you all can do it. Please do not become hard or upset. Everything works out for the good of those who love the Lord. All my love always. I love you all with all my heart. Sharon Sherry Smith P.S. Nana, I love you so much. I kind of always felt like your favorite. You were mine. I love you a lot. She sealed her missive with a smiley face. Police inferred that, due to the lack of financial demands, the implications of this letter were that sex crimes had occurred or were imminent. Famous criminal profiler John Douglas, who wrote the book Mind Hunter, was consulted to give his impressions of the offender based on what information regarding the crime were available. His theories on the suspect. Caucasian male, under 50 years old, experienced in abduction, buried all traces to him effectively, a dedication to detail, a penchant for being in control, extensive knowledge of current trends in technology, which enabled him to disguise his voice when he called the Smith home, might even have worked as an electrician in his late 20s or early 30s, estranged from spouse, has children but has no presence in their lives. Feelings of insecurity and inadequacy may originate from other areas of his life, i.e., women were not taken with him, or at least it is how he perceived himself, and therefore became convinced he could only strike out with a girl like Sherry under the conditions of consensual relations. June 2nd. The telephone rang at the Smith residence. Dawn answered. Hello? A disguised masculine voice on the other end said, Mrs. Smith? Dawn stiffened when she realized it was the kidnapper, but she kept her composure. She said, No, this is Dawn. I need to speak to your mother. Could I ask who is calling? No. Okay, okay, hold on just a second, please. After a moment, Hilda got on the line. Hello? Have you received the mail today? Yes, I have. Do you believe me now? Well, I'm not really sure I believe you because I haven't had any word from Sherry, and I need to know that Sherry is well. You'll know in two or three days. Why two or three days? Call off the search. Tell me if she is well, because of her disease. Are you taking care of her? The caller hung up. The call was traced to a phone booth located outside a pharmacy just a few miles away from the Smith domicile. The Smiths and Sheriff Metz made an appearance on the evening news. Bob personally appealed to the kidnappers, he said. Whoever has our daughter, Sherry, we want her back. We miss her. We love her. Please send her back home. She belongs here with us. A woman known as Mrs. Terry saw the broadcast and recalled that an incident that nearly resulted in her getting into an accident with a fellow motorist happened to involve the man who abducted Sherry Smith. She recognized the car, and his reckless driving did occur on the street where the Smith family dwelled. Though she was only able to get a cursory glance at the man, she recalled that he was a white male with a moon face and receding hairline. With Terry's help, 
a police composite sketch was able to render an approximation of the perpetrator's appearance. The Smiths got another call from him. Don answered, Hello? Don, did you come down from Charlotte? Yes, I did. Who's calling, please? I need to speak with your mother. Okay, she's coming. Tell her to hurry. She's hurrying. Tell Sherry I love her. Did you get the letter? Yes, we did. Here's mother. Did you receive Sherry Ray's letter? Pardon? I can't hear you. It's not very clear. Speak louder. Did you receive the letter today? Uh, yes, I did. Tell me one thing it said. Hurry. Shaw Richard. What? There was a little heart on the side, Shaw Richard, written on the side. How many pages? Two pages. Okay. And was it a yellow legal pad? Yes. And on one side of the front page, it said, Jesus is love, right? No, it said, God is love. Well, God is love, right? Okay, so now you know that this, this is not a hoax call. Yes, I know that. I'm trying to do everything possible to answer some of your prayers. So please, in the name of God, work with us here. Can you answer me one question, please? You, you are very kind and and you seem to be a compassionate person and and I think you know how I feel being Sherry's mother and how much I love her. Can you tell me, is she all right physically without her medication? Sherry is drinking a little over two gallons of water per hour and is going to the bathroom right afterward. Well... Okay now, this has gone too far. Please forgive me. Have an ambulance ready at any time at your house. And at Sherry's request, she requests that only immediate family come and Sheriff Metz and the ambulance attendants. She don't want to make a circus out of this. Right, okay. And where she said casket closed in parentheses, if anything happens to her, she said her one of her requests that she did not put there was to put her hands on her stomach, cross her hands like she was praying in the casket. What now? Cross her hands. Why would anything happen to you? We don't want any harm to you. I, I promise... We just want Sherry well and all right, okay? Okay, now, does Sheriff Metz realize this is not the hoax call? Yes, he knows this is not a hoax. Well, tell him to just forget all those suspects, and the only thing when I talk to you Monday morning, 2.30 in the morning the first time. Yes, yes, I did not realize. I thought you were a police officer. Okay, then listen. Listen real carefully. I've got to hurry. I know these calls are being traced, correct? I do not know. Okay, now listen. I'm listening. Yeah, hold on a second. After a pause, she said, Are you still there? Yes, okay, just hold on a second. Uh, is Sherry with you, or can you tell me that? I will not say. I can tell you're upset. Okay, now listen to us, please. Hold on before I forget it. You're all looking in the wrong place. Forget Lexington. Look in Saluda County. Do you understand? Look in Saluda County? Exactly. Uh, closest to Lexington County within a 15-mile radius right over the line. Is that understood? Yes. Now please, and very, very soon, please. Now Sherry's request, 
Sherry Fay requests, please no strangers heartily, and when y'all, when we give the location, no strangers, absolutely. Okay, now, did you understand about the holding of the hands like she was in prayer in case something happens to us? Yes, if something happens to y'all, but nothing, listen, nobody is going to harm you, I promise you that. Well, tell Sheriff Metz that he... I don't know what the problem is. I told you to forget looking around your house. Look in Saluda County. Listen, do you believe me now? I believe you. There are so many people who love Sherry. I know that. And they just won't give up. They just continue to look. I want to tell you. I want to tell you one other thing. Sherry is now a part of me, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Our souls are now one. Your souls are now one with Sherry? Yes, and we're trying to work this out. So please, do what we ask. You haven't been doing that. I don't understand, and she doesn't. And we sit here, and we watch TV, and we don't see no sheriff. We, why doesn't Sherry talk to me? She, she knows me so well. That's why she asked me to communicate with you, not your husband. Aren't you aware of that? Yes, I know that. I know that she would ask you to talk with me. And she said she does love y'all. And like she said, do not let this ruin your lives. We're not going to let it ruin our... But listen, you tell Sherry one thing. What is that? There's no way my life could ever have any happiness in it again if Sherry left this world with me bearing a guilt that I had failed in such a bad way. Because I love her and I want to make her happy. I'll do anything. She knows that. I'll do anything to work it out. She doesn't have to come home, okay? I'm serious. She does not have to come home. Anything. Ah, uh, well, time up. And, well, time's up. Please, now, have the ambulance ready at any time. At any time. This will not go any further, and it will be soon. The ambulance. You're not telling me that something's going to happen to her, and I'm going to have to have an ambulance? No. I'm telling you her condition. Is her condition getting bad? Is that what you're trying to tell me? You know more about it than I do. I know I do, and that's why I'm so worried about her. Well, you just have the ambulance, and I'll tell you the location. And tell Sheriff Metz to get all his damn men in Saluda County. Okay? Well, God bless all of us. Will you call me soon? I will. Will you call me back tonight? I just need reassurance that she's still okay. I've got to be careful. I've got to go now and... And listen. Please, please, please forgive me for this. It just got out of hand. I know. Listen, do me one thing. What is that? Hurry! Just tell Sherry I know she knows how much I love her. Tell her. Tell her her daddy loves her, and her daddy will work anything out with her under the sun, and he admits we got a lot of problems, but we'll work them out. And her brother and sister love her. God bless you for taking care of my baby. Sherry is protected, and like I said, she is a part of me now. And God looks after all of us. Good night. Good luck to you, too. As usual, the call was traced to a payphone, and typically, the offender and any trace of him could not be located. Fear and paranoia swept over the community at large. 
Once permissive parents now made of their children latchkey kids, even if they were in their late teens. Any male with a scruffy appearance and a Judas Priest t-shirt was assumed to be suspicious. People looked over their shoulders as they went about their business in town. People who didn't own guns or owned only one bought one or more, and those of legal age were taught how to shoot if they hadn't been trained. Sheriff Metz announced in a press conference that the search would be expanded to Saluda County. The Smiths made another appearance on television. Breaking the fourth wall, speaking to Sherry directly, Hilda said, Sherry, we love you so much. We're just not going to give up on finding you. We're not a family without you. The Smith family received another call on June 4th. Once again, Don answered. Don? Yes. This is Sherry Fay's request. Have your mother get on the other phone quickly. To get on the other phone. Don beckoned to Hilda to get on the line. The caller said, Get a pencil and paper ready. Don repeated, saying, Get a pencil and paper ready. Okay. Okay. She's not on the phone yet. Well, I'll tell you this. Okay? You are aware that was in Sherry's own handwriting? Yes, I am. All right? Okay, now this is Sherry's own words. Okay. So listen carefully. Say nothing unless you're asked. Okay. Okay, and it's not necessary. I know these calls are taped. Uh-huh. And traced. But that's irrelevant now. There's no money demanded, so here's Sherry Fay's last request. On the fifth day to put the family at rest, Sherry Fay being freed. Remember, we are one soul now. When you locate... When located, you'll locate both of us together. We are one. God has chosen us. Respect all past and present requests. Actual events and times. Jot this down. Hurry. All right, I'm doing it. 3.28 in the afternoon, Friday, 31st of May. Sherry, wait a minute, too fast. 3.28 afternoon. Sherry Fay was kidnapped by your mailbox with a gun. She had the fear of God in her, and she was at the mailbox. That is why she did not return back to her car. She had... She had to fear what? Fear of God. Fear of God. Okay. 4.58 a.m. No, I'm sorry. Hold on a minute. 3.10 a.m. Saturday, the 1st of June. Um, she hand-wrote what you received. 4.58 a.m. Saturday, the, the 1st of June. Okay, Saturday, 1st of June, 4.58 a.m. Became one soul. Became one soul. Hilda was not directly involved in the conversation, but she was listening in. Upon hearing, became one soul, she said, What does that mean? No questions now. All right. Last, between 4 and 7 Wednesday, tomorrow, have an ambulance ready. Remember, no circus. 4 and prayer. Wait, 4 and 7 a.m.? 4 and 7 in the afternoon, tomorrow. In the afternoon. Tomorrow. Okay. Okay, have an ambulance ready. Remember her request. No circus. Prayers and relief coming soon. Please learn to enjoy life. Forgive. God protects the chosen. Sherry Faye's important request. Rest tonight and tomorrow. Good shall come out of this. And please, tell Sheriff Metz, search no more. Blessings are near. Tomorrow, 
Wednesday, four in the afternoon until seven in the evening. Ambulance ready, no circus. No circus, what does that mean? You will receive last instructions where to find us. Please forgive, Hilda interjected. Do not kill my daughter, please. I mean, please, let me, we love and miss y'all. Get good rest tonight, Hilda said. Listen, goodbye. Wait a minute. Don said, he's gone, Mama. June 5th, the police secured the cooperation of the area's telephone service provider and arranged to have most of the pay phones temporarily deactivated. The pay phones that remained in service would be surveilled with officers keeping a close eye on the individuals using them. June 6th, the phone rang at the Smith residence. There was only one caller they most wanted to hear from. Hilda answered this time, Speak of the devil. Listen carefully. Take Highway 378 west to the traffic circle. Take Prosperity exit. Go one and a half miles. Turn right at the sign Moose Lodge number 103. Then go one quarter mile. Turn left at the white framed building. Go back a yard. Six feet beyond, we are waiting. God chose us. Sadly, the caller phoned 20 minutes before the payphones were scheduled to be disconnected. Hilda begged Sheriff Metz to take her with him and his staff when they went to the payphone from whence the call was made. He could not grant her wish. However heartless this gesture may have appeared, he placed a high premium on hers and her family's safety and well-being. They were better off at the house. The police dispatched a helicopter to search the area and route described by the caller to Hilda. It was located within the environs of a Masonic lodge. Something caught their eye in the foliage. Fifty feet to the rear of the lodge and six to eight feet beyond a line of trees. Sherry was discovered. Their search was now over. Sherry was dead. When a police officer paid a visit to the Smith residence to deliver the tragic news, the emotions were high, as expected. Bob said, Are you sure it's Sherry? No, it's her. Hilda was hysterical, saying, Not my baby! Oh God, not my baby! Bob held her. Don said to the police captain, Where is she? I want to see Sherry for myself. He said, no, I, I cannot let you do that. Why not? It's not necessary for any family members to identify the body. It's in bad shape. But we are sure it is Sherry we found. I'm so, so sorry. I'm going to leave you alone now. The entire family assembled in Don's room and cried for hours. The Smiths were always devout Christians and while Dawn never lost her own faith, it was shaken after Sherry's death. As she wrote in her memoir entitled, Grace So Amazing, God, how could you? Why would you let this happen to us? How could you let Sherry suffer? Oh God, how much she must have suffered. Did you even listen to my constant prayers all this time? Didn't you hear anything I said? Evidently not. You could have stopped this from happening, couldn't you? Thanks a lot, God, for nothing. When Sherry was found, the heat and humidity of the season had accelerated the decomposition process. Insects crawled over her. The coroner announced that determining the exact cause of death would be difficult 
due to the advanced stages of decay in her flesh. Her corpse had been dragged to the location where she was found. One Dr. Sexton was the pathologist who performed the autopsy. Dental records confirmed that she was Sherry Smith. Because of the decomposition, there was no way to tell if she had been assaulted, sexually or otherwise. He did discover ligature marks on her wrists. There was also some residue from duct tape on her face. It seemed she spent part of the abduction bound. Dr. Sexton decided she must have died of strangulation. To quote his report, As far as the manner of death, since the death occurred during an abduction, the manner of death will still be homicide, regardless of whether it is due to depriving the decedent of water or from some type of homicidal asphyxia. Recognizing the importance of reassuring the public via the media, Sheriff Metz said in a press conference, We are concerned that this person may take his own life if he doesn't turn himself in. We don't want him to do that. I want to reassure him that we have no intentions of killing anyone. All we want to do is take this person into custody. We're trying to get this person to surrender. He needs help, and we want him to get it. He sounds as if he is afraid, as if he doesn't know whether to take his own life or turn himself in. Just hours later, another phone call was received. This time, one Charlie Keyes, an investigative reporter for WIS-TV, a news station, answered the call. Keyes embraced his role as intermediary between the suspect and the police. The suspect said to Keyes, Okay, now listen carefully. I can't live with myself, Charlie, and I need to turn myself in, and I'm afraid. And you're a very intelligent person, and I want you to be there with Sheriff Metz and all the officers he wants at his home in the morning. And you answer the phone. At whose home? At Sheriff Metz's home. Hurry now. Don't answer any questions unless I ask. You be there and answer the phone. The suspect had more instructions for keys. He was to broadcast his segment of the news from Sheriff Metz's house that evening. He also insisted that the priest who administered to Sherry Smith at her church be present. When calling, Keyes was to recite details and quotes from Sherry's will and testament. This would be done to prove that he was legit. The suspect told Keyes that if he followed every instruction down to the last letter, he would give Keyes an exclusive interview. The suspect had a lot more to say. Now, Charlie, please. It just went bad. I know her family and he... And, well, I just made a mistake. It went too far. All I wanted to do was make love to her. I didn't know she had the rare disease, and it just got out of hand. I got scared, and I... I have to do the right thing, Charlie. Now please, work with me, because I feel like I can trust you, and I've listened to you many times. That's why I picked you as the medium. Keys did not contradict the man or question him at all. The call was being recorded by the station so that it could be forwarded to police. The suspect had more. Please forgive me. God forgive me and take care of me. I need the help bad, and I want to do the right thing. And tell them to please honor Sherry Fay's request. Casket closed. Plus, take her hands and fold them on her stomach like she's praying. You understand that? Police noticed something odd about this call. He didn't expect him to say that he knew the Smiths on a personal basis. To quote John Douglas, His statement, I didn't know she had the rare disease, proved we were right when we assessed the business about his being a friend of the family. 
which he also said in calls with Hilda and Dawn, as bunk. Anyone truly close to the family knew of Sherry's condition. It was just another part of his fantasy, trying to draw a connection with this beautiful girl he had first seen at a distance. We also knew, despite his protestations, that he was not going to turn himself in. He was getting too much satisfaction out of this. The only true words he uttered in the entire exchange with the reporter were when he said he'd wanted to make love to her. But whether he was able to accomplish that as a sexual assault while she lived or not, he would have known he would have to kill her afterward. Did he actually feel guilty about what he had done to Sherry? Perhaps there might have been a tinge of guilt. Though even that I doubted. What we firmly believed from his signature and M.O., modus operandi, was that if this individual was not caught, and caught soon, he would kill again. As time would tell, Douglas's assessment would prove to be highly accurate and prescient. Another call came to the Smith residence. Since Don didn't live there, it was suspicious that the man on the other end, calling Collect, only wanted to speak to her. When Don returned after walking the family's dog, she took the phone. She recognized that voice. He identified himself as Joe Wilson, but considering that he had disguised his voice, the name was most likely a pseudonym, the following is an approximation of the dialogue that occurred between the two. I'm calling for Sherry Fay. And are you aware that I'm turning myself in tomorrow morning? No. Well, have you talked to Sheriff Metz or Charlie Keyes? Though the name Charlie Keyes was vaguely familiar to Dawn, she could not place it. She said, uh, no. The voice said, undisguised now. We'll talk to them and listen carefully. Dawn was full of so much rage and pain, it was a struggle to keep herself composed. Nevertheless, she agreed to play his little game for the time being. She said, Okay, I have to tell you this, that uh, Sherry asked me to... Uh, turned myself in on the... After the fifth day after they found her. Wait, I'm trying to write this down. Don't write it down. Don't write it down. Don't write it down. Okay. And, uh... Or get myself straight with God and... Uh... Turn myself completely over to Him. So I have to turn myself over to Him. Okay. And, uh, they'll, uh, Charlie Keys, you'll know what I'm talking about when you talk to him. He will not be able to get a personal interview with me in the morning. I'm, uh, there will be a letter. It's already been mailed. An exact copy for you and for him. And it's with pictures. A copy to me. Yes, and him at his house. Yes, and him at his home of pictures of Sherry Fay from the time even I made her stand up to her car and took two pictures and all through the thing. And the letter will describe exactly what happened from the time I picked her up until the time... Uh, I called and told y'all where to find her. Okay. And I'll be doing the same thing in the morning at 6 a.m. And tell the sheriff and Charlie Keys. Charlie Keys. I used him as a medium today and I talked to him. Okay. 6 a.m. What will you be doing in the morning? Well, he'll know. Oh, he'll? He'll already know. He'll know. Okay, and also that, uh, uh, that I will be armed, but by the time they find me, I won't be dangerous. You, 
You... Do you understand that? You will be armed. But by the time they find me, I won't be dangerous. What does that mean? Well, I... Sherry Faye said, If I couldn't live with myself, and she wouldn't forgive me if I didn't turn myself over and turn myself in or turn myself over to God. So I'm going to have to... I just... This thing got out of hand, and all I wanted to do was make love to Dawn. I've been watching her for a couple of... To who? To... I'm sorry. To Sherry. And I watched her for a couple of weeks, and uh, it just got out of hand. And Dawn... Dawn, I, I, I hope you and your family forgive me for this. You're not going to kill yourself, are you? I... I don't... I can't live in prison and go to the electric chair. I can't do that. I... This is the only way I can get myself straight. I'm very sick and... But I... I can't go through... We don't want you to die. We want to help you. Don't kill yourself. No, I just, uh, you can't take someone's life, and this is the way it's going to have to be, Sherry said. Well, see, listen to me, okay? Well, listen, I have to go. No, I've got to tell you something, okay? This is important. I know these calls, God can, are being traced. God well, that's okay, but God can forgive you and erase all of that. Dawn, I can't. I can't live with myself. And we can forgive you, too. In prison for the rest of myself, or go to the electric chair. Listen, Sherry's at peace with God. She's better off than any of us. Well, I want to say something to you that she told me. Okay. Sherry, oh boy, Sherry Faye said that uh, she did not cry the entire time. She was very strong-willed, and she said that uh, she did not want y'all to ruin your lives and to go on with your lives like the letter said. And I've never lied to you before, right? Everything I've told you came true, right? Yes. Okay, so this is going to have to be the way it is. And she said that uh, she wasn't scared, that she knew she was going to be an angel. And if I took the latter choice that she suggested to me, that she would forgive me, but our God's going to be the major judgment, and she'll probably end up seeing me in heaven, not in hell. And uh, she requests, now please remember this. Now she requests that y'all be sure to take her hands and fold them in on her stomach like she's praying. Okay. And that closed casket. Yeah. They already made those plans? Yes. Okay. And please have Charlie Keys with Sheriff Metz. And Charlie knows what to do in the morning and have an ambulance and probably... Before they get there, they might as well have a hearse also and uh, be at the traffic circle. The And I'm not in. I'll be... I'm just going to allow myself enough time to get in the area and get set up. I'm not in the area now. And uh, it'll be at 6 in the morning that I'll call his office. And by the time they reach me, I'll be be straight with God. And uh, Sherry said, please take the gold necklace that she had on. And the she had one earring on in her left ear. Uh-huh. And uh, save those things and treasure them. Save them. Yes. The necklace was given to Sherry by her boyfriend, Richard with whom Sherry was very much in love, so Dawn naturally found this to be a strange request. She doesn't want Richard to have the necklace? 
Uh, she said something. There was some special jewelry in her room that she said. I forgot what. It might have been the necklace, but, uh, yeah, go. Go ahead. But the rest of her stuff is, irre is ir irrelevant. Okay. She felt that y'all would divvy up, and... What about her high school ring? Uh, that's... She said everything else would be decided by the family. But Sherry was... was not afraid, and she didn't cry or anything? No, she didn't do anything. And, uh... Can you handle it if I tell you how she died? Um... Okay. Okay, be strong now. She, she said she... You were. She told me all about the family and everything. We talked and... Oh, God. And I am a family friend. That's the sad part. You are a family friend? Yeah. And that's why I can't face y'all. You... You'll find out in the morning, or tomorrow, but, uh, forgive me, and, uh, Dawn, uh, Sherry, I don't know whether you were aware of, okay, I tied her up to the bedpost, and, uh, with the electrical cord, and I took duct tape, and wrapped it all the way around her head, and suffocated her, and tell the coroner or get the information out how she died. And um, I was unaware she had this disease. I probably wouldn't ever taken her. Uh, uh, I shouldn't have took her anyway. It got out of hand. Uh huh. And uh, I'd asked her out before. And she said she would if she wasn't going with anybody. And, uh, um, she also said that, uh, oh yeah, make sure Charlie Keyes, you know him, the reporter on WIS? I can't think of who he is right now. Okay, they'll know who he is. He's the one who wears the bow tie on Channel 10. He's the head news fellow on this case for Channel 10. Tell him to be sure to get in touch with Ann David because... Ann Davis? Yeah, she's probably already told him some information. I had to use them for mediums because they were taping your house and stuff. And I know the ironic part. I had to see what was going on at the house. At your house. Yes. And I was there Saturday morning for the search. You were there at the search Saturday? Yes, I was. And if... Oh, God, Don, I wish. I wish y'all could help me, but it's just too late. Let me tell you something, okay? God can forgive you. Well, I have to go now, Don. I know. And through God, we can forgive you also. Well, uh, Dawn, will you forgive me then? Yes. Your family? But I, I just, it, it's, I'll have to take the other choice that, that Sherry Faye said to me. I just can't live with myself like this. I'm not. I think that you just need to think about that a little harder. That you... I'm not going to be caged up like a dog. Okay, now. Is there any other questions? Short. I've got to go now. Time's running out. Uh, when... When you killed Sherry, was she at peace? She wasn't afraid or anything? She was not. She was at peace. She knew that God was with her. And she was going to become an angel. And, and she wrote that letter to us of her own free will. And all that was... She sure did. Everything I've told y'all has been the truth. It hasn't everything... 
Everything came true? Yes, it has. Okay, and now I'll be in the area uh, just a long enough time to set this up for myself. Uh-huh. And, uh, like I said, I... Also, Charlie and everything requested. I mean, I told you that I requested Sherry. I asked Sherry Faye if I could do this, and she said that it was fine with her to have her minister, the preacher from Lexington Baptist, be in the ambulance. Be in the ambulance. Lewis Abbott? Lewis Abbott was the name of the Smith's pastor. The caller said, huh? Lewis Abbott? Uh, yeah, I forgot. She, she told me his name. I forgot who it was. The, the who that was going to... The who that was going to... Y'all's regular minister with the church. That's him, okay? Okay. The one that's going to do the funeral on Saturday? Yes. Okay. Can, can I ask you one more question? One more and that's it. When, when you, uh, you told us that you, Sherry was kidnapped at gunpoint? Yeah. But she knew you. Yeah. At first, see, I pulled up and, uh, I'm telling you the truth. I have no reason to lie to y'all. Okay, I've always told you the truth, right? Right. Okay, and uh, I had her, asked her to stand there, and I took two instant pictures. You asked her to stand where? At the mailbox with her car in the background. Those pictures, detailed pictures, will be with, with the letter y'all received probably since I'm out of town, probably not till Saturday. Uh-huh. And Charlie Keys will get a copy, and your family will get a copy, and it's addressed to you, unless the mail holds it up. So she didn't realize you were fixing to kidnap her. That's exactly right. Okay. And, uh, she's, uh, she, uh, what else? She doesn't, uh, so I'll just be in there long enough to get set up for tomorrow morning and tell the Sheriff Metz that it's no use in uh, uh, trying to trace these calls or catch me. It's too late now. I won't be taken alive. And also, Don, that uh, uh, he can just call off the damn search. It's, it's over now, and... Why are you talking? I don't want people out there wasting their time, and, and everything I've told you is true, and this is coming true also. I just can't live with it. I can't take it anymore. Sherry Fay was right. We feel like... I feel like I got close to her, and we, we showed me things... She showed me things. She was very... Okay, any more questions? Uh, why are you talking to me instead of mom? She felt like you were strong-willed more than your mother. Oh, did you start talking to her? Who? Mother, at first. Yeah, that was your mother. Oh, I was outside. I didn't know. Uh... She said it was your aunt, but it was your mother, correct? Uh, no, that was my aunt that answered the phone. Oh, it was. Okay. No, she said something about your mother being under medication. Sherry Faye told me, Remember that I told you on the fifth day to let them know where she was so her blessings of the body could be blessed, right? Why on the fifth day did she want us to find her? Why not? I don't know. She just, she just said that. I don't know. I don't have any idea. And, uh, 
I'm telling you exactly how she died. So she died of suffocation. And so, you know, the... Okay, anything else? Why did... Why did you do that? She... I gave her a choice. I... To shoot her or give her a drug overdose or suffocate her. Why did you have to kill her? It just got out of hand. I got scared because... Uh, only God knows, Dawn. I don't know why. God forgive me for this. I hope and I, I got to straighten it out or he'll send me to hell. And I'll be there the rest of my life. But I'm not going to be in prison and the electric chair. But I don't think taking your life is the answer to this. Or I'll, I'll think. Or to forgive you. I'll think about it. Well done. I've got to go now. It's been too long, and... Uh... Tell them to just forget about the search. I'll be in the area long enough in the morning for there to, uh... I'll be there in the... I'll be in the area long enough in the morning for them to, uh... Find me. And by the time I call, uh... There... Charlie Keyes will know exactly the setups. Well, I hope now, uh, I know I'm staying on the phone, all right. They are taping this. I don't want anything messed up, okay? Okay. They are taping it, right? Uh-huh. Okay, good. Okay, and anything else? Uh, I just, uh, uh... Oh yeah, let me tell you, the other night, they almost caught me. I wanted them to catch me. I felt that way all the time. But now, when? When was this? Uh, when I called you at 9.45? When you were over near Jake's Landing? Yeah, I was at the fast fair thing. I pulled out 20 yards in front of two flashing lights. What color car did you have? They hit it dead on it. Red. And they didn't even... Dawn, I can't get over this. They didn't even turn around and follow me. And I cut right at that blinking light down there to go the back way on Old Cherokee Road. And there was a highway patrolman or somebody in front of me and let me turn right on Old Cherokee Road. Can you believe it? So you really wanted to be caught at that time, but it's too late now. What kind of car was it? Oh, well, they were mighty close. I, Dawn, they're not going to catch me, and I, I can't give you much information because I got to make it back in time. And they'll stop me before I get back if I tell you, but they're right. It was a red one, and I almost got caught three or four times. Was it a red Jetta? Dawn, that's irrelevant now. If I die now, or if I die at six in the morning, it's irrelevant. Well, listen, uh, Dawn, I really, I wish you would, anything else? I wish you would not kill yourself. And she told me to tell you, Please go back to Carowinds. I know you live in Charlotte, and uh, I know a lot about your family, and uh, go back and start singing, and give it your best, and she knows that she'll be singing like crazy. She was, uh, when she said that, she was smiling. She'll be singing like crazy. She was smiling? She was smiling, and, well, so she wasn't afraid the whole time. No, never. Because she knew that she was going to be with God? That's exactly right. The whole time. She's so strong-willed, and, and, but I just, really, I wish that you wouldn't think about killing yourself. I will, Dawn. You need to think about it a lot because, okay, well, put it this way. If I, 
if I decide between now and six in the morning, I'll, uh, oh, I'll, listen, our prayers will be for you. Okay, I'll call you collect. Did you hear what I said? Will you be home tonight? We are home tonight. Can I ask you? Listen, our prayers will be with you, okay? God can do anything, and he can forgive you for this. Yeah, but you know what's going to happen to me, Don? I'm going to be fried. You don't know that God can work miracles. You don't know that it'll happen to you. Well, Don, God is merciful no matter what we do. It's time now. It's time. I got to go now, and I'll just... I'll think about it. But I've got a lot of things on my mind now. I know you know that, right? Right. And... Uh... Uh... You answer the phone every time it rings tonight. Me answer the phone every time it rings? That's right. And if it's collect, and I'll say from the break of day, you'll know. If we're asleep, you let it keep ringing, okay? I will. I will. God bless all of us. God bless you too. And Hilda had woken from a nap. She overheard the conversation in which Don was engaged, and it didn't take her long to deduce who was on the other end. She reached for the phone when she got to Don. Don said to the caller, Wait, Mother wants to say something to you. Please. Listen, Mom wants to say something to you. All right, just one thing, and then I'm gone. Hilda grabbed the receiver and said, Hello? Yes. Well, hurry. Just say one thing and that's it. Don will tell you and you listen to the recordings and there will be a letter you'll receive probably the next day with pictures and detailed information from the time I picked Sherry up at the mailbox until tonight and my departure from the earth. It's over. I will not be taken alive. Don told me to turn myself in or turn myself over to God or I'll never live in peace, and never be forgiven, and go to heaven. Well, turn yourself over to God. That's most important. I am, and this is the only way. I'm not going to spend my life in prison, and go to the electric chair. Uh, well, uh, Don knows everything, and uh, God bless all of us. And I hope, listen, I want to ask you something. This just got out of hand. All you had to do was let her go. I was scared. She, she, she was dehydrating so bad. You could have called me for medicine. I would have met you anywhere. Well, that's irrelevant now. Oh, I mean, all you had to do was let her go. Such a beautiful young life. I know that. That's why I have to join her now. Hopefully. And, uh, Mrs. Smith, please. Uh, please. Uh, uh, okay. Well, that's it. I got to go. Did she know you when you stopped her? Yeah. Uh, there's... There will be pictures, and I took pic... Two pictures, instamatic of, I made her stand. Well, before she knew I was going to kidnap her, I asked her to stand at the mailbox, and you'll see her picture. Her car door, and cars in the background, and, uh, there will be pictures, all. I think there's about eight pictures, and Charlie Keyes will be receiving a set, and a detailed letter, like I told you at his house, and I, if it's, if the mail doesn't slow it down, which it probably will, if you don't get it tomorrow, you'll get it the next day. You'll get exact copies, the pictures that he gets, and uh, exact letters, too. Did you know all of us, or just Sherry? 
I know the whole family, unfortunately. That's why I can't face you. Okay. Well, Mrs. Smith, please. Uh, if I decide different, I've already told Dawn what's going to happen. Her answer the phone tonight only, and it will be collect, and I'm going to allow myself enough time to get back to the area to set everything up if you don't hear from me tonight. And Sheriff Metz and Charlie Keys... I used him as a medium today because I knew the calls were being traced, and they came real close to catching me three or four different times, and they were correct. I am in a red vehicle. What kind? I'm sorry, I don't want them to catch me before I meet my Maker on Judgment Day. You think the Maker is going to forgive you now? He'll... He'll do that, or I'll be crucified and go to hell. That's right. Well, and you need to meet somebody who can talk to you. Well, I'm... I've got a lot to think about, and I'm... I'm gone, Mrs. Smith, and... Uh, please, I... I know this might be selfish, but... Uh, you all, please, ask a special prayer for me. Your... Your daughter said that she was not afraid, and that she was strong-willed. She uh, knew that she was going to heaven, was going to be an angel, and like I told Dawn, she was going to be singing like crazy. And did she, when she said that, she was smiling. Did you tell her you were going to kill her? Yes, I did. And I gave her a choice, like... It's on the recording. I asked her if she wanted to be drug overdosed, shot, or uh, suffocated. And she picked suffocation. My God, how could you? Well, forgive us. God, God, not us, you. God only knows why this happened. I don't know. It just got out of hand. That's, I thought, you know what? Goodbye, Mrs. Smith. I thought you were considerate and loving and a kind person. He hung up. The call was traced to a phone booth located in Great Falls, South Carolina. No traces of the perpetrator were found. A movement honoring Sherry's memory was carried out which consisted of people wearing pink ribbons and attaching pink stickers to surfaces, with the significance of the color being that it was Sherry's favorite. Sherry could not have an open casket funeral due to the condition of her remains. She could not even be dressed. Approximately a thousand people attended her funeral. Soon after the family returned from the funeral, the phone rang. It was answered by Dawn. Hello, I have a collect call for Dawn Smith from Sherry. Will you pay for the call? From who? Sherry. After a sigh, Dawn said, yes. That familiar voice came on the line. It was him. He said, Dawn like the break of day. What? Like the break of day. Is this Don Smith? Yes, it is. Okay, you know this is not a hoax call, correct? Yes. Did I catch you off guard? Well, yeah, because they said it was from Sherry. No, I said concerning Sherry Fay. Everybody screwed up her... Excuse my French. Okay, now listen carefully. Uh, Dawn, I'm real afraid now and everything and... Uh-huh. And I have to, uh, make a decision. I'm going to stay in this area until God gives me the strength to decide which way. And I did go to the funeral today. You did? Yes. And, uh, that ignorant policeman... He even directed me into a parking space. Fellow 
blue uniform outside and they were taking license plate numbers down and stuff, please tell Sheriff Metz, I'm not jerking anybody around. I'm not playing games. This is reality and I'm not an idiot. When he finds my background, he'll see that I'm a highly intelligent person. Okay, and I want to fill in some gaps here between now and next Saturday, the anniversary of Sherry Fay. I'm going to do one way or the other, and if God gives me the strength before then, and I'll call you and give you... All I'll say is, between now and next Saturday. Yes. I think you need to make a decision before then. Well, now listen carefully. Don't ask questions. Think of questions you want, but not now, okay? And I'll code so you know it won't be a hoax. I don't want... I never wanted that, okay? We'll still use... When you answer the phone or whoever, I'll say dawn like the break of day. We'll only know that, okay? All right, and... Uh... I could tell her casket was closed, but did y'all honor her request for folding her hands? Yes. Yes, we did, of course. Okay, she'll like that. That'll please her, okay? And, uh, tell Sheriff Metz, like, the FBI, damn, that's like the fear of God in you, for sure. They go out and gun you down, and if I decide... If God gives me the strength, just surrender like that. I'll call you and I'll do... I'll call you and all I'll do, like I said, Sherry Faye's location and... Uh, when I see them drive up and I'll see Charlie Keyes and Sheriff Metz get out of the car, they'll recognize me. I'll approach them and I'll put my hands straight up in the air and turn my back to them and they can approach me without shooting me and stuff, all right? Okay. Okay, now listen carefully. Sherry Faye was, uh, I'm trying to fill in all the gaps here. Sherry Faye was, uh, God accepted her in Lexington County at 4.58 in the morning, and I delivered her to Saluda County and also... I told you exactly. I gave no reason to lie to you. I told you exactly how she died and so forth. And when I took the duct tape off of her, they, they, the examiner said they're having problems telling how she died. Uh-huh. Uh, when I took the duct tape off, it took a lot of hair with it. So that'll help them out. Where's the duct tape? Only God knows. I don't. Okay, now listen. Now, Richard, uh, okay, did you receive the thing and the pictures in the mail? They're coming. They, the FBI is going to intercept them. Okay, it's written to you. I got Sherry Faye to explain three or four different things. He prattled on about Sherry's relationship with Richard, claiming he was jealous and that it put so much strain on the relationship she was contemplating breaking up with him. Dawn found this hard to believe. She recalled Sherry being very much in love with Richard and happy about the way things were going. After listening to him carry on about that bullshit, Dawn became irate and said, Don't you realize what you've put us through? How could you think about what would happen to yourself? He hung up. The call was traced to Augusta, Georgia. Yet again, law enforcement was no closer to finding the party responsible. John Douglas listened to the recordings of the calls. He wrote the following. We were now pretty sure this unsub was either living alone or with his parents, or perhaps an older female relative who knew nothing about his crimes building on our expectation that he'd have some sort of criminal record involving sex crimes, we figured that wherever he lived, besides the pornography we'd find 
a hidden collection of souvenirs from his exploits, jewelry, underwear, or other personal tokens taken from his victims, including items stolen from women he'd watch as a peeping Tom earlier in his criminal career, breaking into their homes when they were out because he wasn't yet sophisticated enough to carry out an abduction. June 14th. Nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick, her brother Woody, and her sister Becky were out playing in the Shiloh Mobile Home Park in Richland County, South Carolina. Their mother, Deborah Louise, departed for an evening shift at a restaurant. She got a ride from her friend Vicki Orr. They didn't take the kids with them because Deborah's husband Sherwood was due to return from work in the evening and he would assume care of the children. Contrary to their expectations, Sherwood arrived early. Just moments after the women left the trailer park, a car pulled into the park that was unknown to its residents. It was silver-colored with red stripes. It drove down the park's throughway and then made an abrupt U-turn. It drove slowly until it came to a stop in front of the Helmick's home. A man got out of the car. A neighbor of the Helmick's, Ricky Morgan, heard screams. He looked out the window and saw an unfamiliar man grabbing little nine-year-old Deborah May by the waist. She was kicking as she screamed. The man shoved her into his car and sped off. Ricky ran to the Helmix trailer. He shouted to Sherwood, Did you see that man take your daughter? Sherman said he hadn't. The white noise from his air conditioner drowned out most outside sound. The two men saw three-year-old Woody hiding under a bush. He was petrified to the point of crying. He said, The bad man said he was coming back to get me. Sherwood took off in his vehicle in pursuit of the silver car of Ricky's description. Sherwood was unable to find the car in question, so when he spotted a police car, he reported to the officers what had happened. It didn't take long for news of this incident to spread, especially among the police. Deborah Helmick may have been much younger than Sherry Smith, but she looked very much like her, i.e. blonde hair and blue eyes. The Smiths and the Helmicks lived less than 30 miles from each other. Ricky described the suspect as being a slightly overweight Caucasian male with a pale complexion and a receding hairline. Deborah was abducted exactly two weeks after Sherry Smith, down to the hour. The police were not about to waste any time, and they deployed a helicopter to conduct an aerial search. After Ricky Morgan provided more details of the suspect's appearance to police, a composite sketch was put together, and the result was strikingly similar to that of the sketch that was produced of the man who abducted and killed Sherry Smith. Giving even more detail, Ricky said, The man was wearing white short pants and a light-colored sleeveless shirt, and he had something white in his hand that looked like a bag. When he approached the children, he leaned over like he was talking to them. That's when he grabbed Deborah May, and she started kicking and screaming. I saw her feet hitting the top of the car as he threw her across the seat, and then she stopped kicking. The car he saw was not an Oldsmobile. He estimated it to be a 1982 or 1983 Grand Prix or Monte Carlo. One aspect of this kidnapping that would distinguish it from that of Sherry Smith was that the Helmix didn't have a telephone at that time. So if it truly was the same man who had committed this crime, he would be unable to taunt the victim's family at least not directly. What would he do as an alternative? June 22nd. 
The phone rang at the Smith residence. Dawn answered. The operator said, This is a collect call from Sherry Faye Smith. Yes, I'll take the call. Thank you. Dawn, you know this isn't a hoax, correct? Uh, did you find Sherry Faye's ring? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, I don't know where it is, okay? You know? Uh, God wants you to join Sherry Faye. It's just a matter of time. This month, next month, this year, next year, you can't be protected all the time. And you know, uh, have you heard about Deborah May Helmick? Richland County? Yeah. Go one north. Well, one west. Turn left at Peach Festival Road or Bill's Grill. Go three and a half miles through Gilbert. Turn right. Last dirt road before you come to a stop sign at Two Notch Road. Go through chain and no trespassing sign. Go 50 yards and to the left go 10 yards. Deborah May is waiting. God forgive us all. Hey, listen. What? Uh, just out of curiosity, how old are you? Dawn E., your time is near. God forgive us and protect us all. Good night for now, Dawn E. Smith. Wait a second here. What happened to those pictures you said you were going to send me? Oh, apparently the FBI must have them. No, sir, because when they have something, we get it too, you know. Are you going to send them? I think you were jerking me around because you said they were coming and they're not here. Good night, Don. I'll talk to you later. The police traced the call to a phone booth located at a shopping mall. There was no trace of the perpetrator. The police followed the directions he gave regarding the whereabouts of Deborah May Helmick. Her remains were found in a wooded area. Her body had reached an advanced stage of decomposition due to the broiling South Carolina sun. One odd detail was that she was wearing two pairs of underwear. One pair was plain white and cotton, typical of the kind a little girl would wear. The other was made of satin and fashioned into a bikini cut, more appropriate for an adult female. Tufts of Deborah's hair were found throughout the area, one of which still had a pink barrette attached to it. The hair was tacky with residue from duct tape. The body was assumed to be Deborah May Helmick. It was so badly decomposed they couldn't make a positive identification on sight alone. Not until the autopsy. Strangulation was determined to be the most likely cause of death during the autopsy. The fingerprints and bottoms of her feet were examined to find matches. Dental records did not exist for Deborah May, so that was ruled out as an option. Deborah Louise verified that the barrette had belonged to Deborah May. As Deborah Louise put it, Around two o'clock that day, I washed her hair brushed it, and put two pink barrettes in it. That's one of them. June 24th, the body was confirmed as having been Deborah May Helmick. As police now made the assumption that the abduction cases of Sherry Smith and Deborah Helmick were connected, Deborah Louise Helmick said, We watched the news about Sherry's abduction and murder on TV, and Deborah May would sit on the floor in front of the TV and listen to it and say how pretty Sherry was and how sad it was that she was killed. After the abductions were connected, all we could see on TV was Deborah May's picture right there beside Sherry's. 
Sherwood could not take the visage of his daughter's picture on the television screen next to that of Sherry Smith. In a fit of rage, he threw the television out the door. The Smith family attended Deborah May's funeral. The letter written by Sherry on a legal pad bore traces of a grocery list and a phone number. Police called the number, which belonged to a married couple, Ellis and Sharon Shepard. They had gone on vacation and hired a man who worked alongside Ellis as an electrician's assistant to house-sit for them. They said he was a normal, mild-mannered man in his mid-thirties who lived with his parents. He was divorced and had a 12-year-old son. He was not in contact with his son. He was hardworking and detail-oriented. They also recall that he was obsessed with the murder of Sherry Smith. He talked about nothing but, and saved every newspaper clipping he could get his hands on. An officer played a recording of the man who had been calling the Smith house. Ellis said, That's Larry Jean Bell. No doubt about it. The police were also informed that the Shepherds allowed Bell to use their 38 pistol. At one point, it was found under the mattress on which he was sleeping, next to an issue of Hustler magazine. A blonde woman restrained in bondage was featured on the cover. The next day, Larry Jean Bell was taken into custody by police. Those who knew Larry Jean Bell well were not privy to his darkest secrets, such as the time in 1975 when he committed assault and battery on a woman. His five-year sentence was suspended, and he was given probation. A few months later, he was charged for assaulting a woman he attempted to force into his car, but he got off with no real consequences for this offense either. In 1979, he harassed a 10-year-old girl, which included over 80 obscene phone calls. He only served five years of probation. He was a person of interest in many other cases involving the disappearances of women and girls, but his culpability could not be backed up with evidence. August 12th. Larry Jean Bell was indicted for the abduction and murder of Sherry Smith. The trial was delayed until February 10, 1986, due to the fact that the court was struggling to find impartial jurors who would not have wanted to mete out vigilante justice. During the trial, Bell carried on as if he were mentally ill claiming to have killed other women, but refusing to answer questions about the crimes. He claimed to have been possessed by an evil spirit. He didn't exactly ingratiate himself to the court when he asked Don Smith to marry him. Multiple times. Many people believed he was faking the psychiatric symptoms to avoid being incarcerated in prison. February 23rd, after three hours of deliberation, the jury found Larry Jean Bell guilty on all counts. The state indicated that they would pursue the death penalty. April 2nd, 1987, Larry Jean Bell received another death sentence for the abduction and murder of Deborah May Helmick. This time the jury only deliberated for one hour. In prison, Larry Jean Bell was segregated from the general population, who referred to him as Baby Killer. 1993. Don Smith became engaged to a man named Will Jordan. Larry Jean Bell found out about it somehow and sent them a card. He wished Don a 25th birthday. He also wished them happiness in their then upcoming nuptials. October 4th, 1996. Larry Jean Bell was executed at the age of 46. 
Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.